false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of Shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19:5. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today on the Sabbath day, the 25th of August 2018, I'm gathered here together via Skype with my brother in Germany, uh, Michael, and my wonderful brother in the United States of America, Brett Norman, and uh, we have come together to make the fifth and probably final reading of the paper of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Um, to end the dispute between some people, maybe, hopefully, uh, the question if uh, Simon Peter, the Apostle, ever was in Rome. I mean, we have made some very clear points of that in the past with the first four broadcasts. This is the fifth now and hopefully the last one of this introduction before we go into the book of Ernest L. Martin. But, you know, some people you can prove as many things as you want, they will never believe just because they don't want to. But anyway, I don't want to go into a long monologue on my own. I just want to invite my two brothers in Christ to the broadcast here. And I'm going to start with the one who is closest by, and that is Germany. That is Michael. Hello, Michael, and welcome to the broadcast. How are you doing? Yeah, hello, Jörg. Uh, thanks for asking. I'm uh, quite fine. And on uh, Sabbath day, I'm more uh, anxious to know about uh, the found the uh, the basement of the Roman Catholic Church because if you uh, put away their basement, their um, basement that the Fo Peter foundation was in, is what foundation you mean. foundation yeah the foundation that Peter uh, was in Rome uh, yeah then the whole building will start to crumble That's and right. I think it's yeah. it's it's very important and I'm also looking forward for the the final, uh, the final chapter now. Yeah, but actually, your word "basement" is not that wrong either, because you have to go down to the basement or to the cellar to dig out the bones of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, and it's true. <laughs> in that regard, your your choice of words was not that bad. <laughs> but thank you, Michael, and uh, this is also a little a welcome say goodbye to your. Uh, week of holiday that you had right you had a week of vacation right yes i did and i and i think i have uh, i have made uh, many things uh, uh, quite uh, fine in that week i did uh, bought a bicycle for my mother and i met a wonderful friend and so on <laughs> ah yeah yeah. Ah, yeah yeah that friend i know i think yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well, let's turn over to brett over there anxious in the united states waiting in the morning oh, sipping his you. second or third cup of coffee uh, <laughs> to yes, join us yes, in the yes. reading brett norman how hi brother how are you doing i'm doing just fine and thank you for inviting me in wonderful to be here well, this reading wouldn't be the same without you or with Michael. It's just uh, lovely to have you both guys, uh, to have both you guys on, on the call here and uh, that we can share this um, reading oh, together. Oh, yes, you're on and certainly Simon Peter it, would, Simon it would never be the same without you as well, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I do most of the reading, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I just, I just appreciate so much the company. You know, uh, maybe yes. this is something I should just share before we go on. Uh, during this week, I was uh, in the middle of the night, a few minutes past midnight. I, I saw on my second YouTube channel that this guy who has a German channel, uh, who is called Tony Mahoney, was online for a live broadcast, 
And I just uh, listened into that and I said hi and then he invited me via Google Hangouts to his call and I took that and we did um, a broadcast for more than an hour together and we spoke about the Bible and we spoke about the reading of um, of this uh, little pamphlet that I have from 1903, the Jesuits and the German Reich. We spoke about behind the dictators and we spoke about the Bible and uh, some some different things for more than an hour. And at the end of the broadcast, then I invited him to come next day to my reading of um, Behind the Dictators with Victor. And uh, so that was yesterday, Friday evening. And um, we then had a session together and read uh, the fourth part of the seventh chapter of Behind the Dictators in German, the b uh, greatest Trojan horse of them all. We, we read mm. with, uh, uh, with three wow. people on Skype together. So that also That's was wonderful. Great. It's, it's always yes. nice to have guests, you know. I have been reading yes, Rulers of it Evil really completely helps. by myself. I have been reading really um, Babylon Mystery Religion all by myself and, and a few things in German. And now all of a sudden I have these acquaintances, these friends, these brothers in Christ, I like to call them even, like you. Yes, and that's like, right. Uh, and, and like Michael, who was on the call here with us, uh, who are even interested in uh, doing that reading with me and uh, also bringing, up, uh, bringing their uh, opinion, their knowledge and their understanding to the, ta to the table. Which is always, always better, you know, it's always better to have two brains than just one or three to have just one. And Absolutely. It's, it's always a little kind of a, of a Bible study, Brett. Yes, it is. Jesus said, wherever True. two or three of you are gathered in my name and their midst, That's I will exactly. be. And we are gathered here in his name to bring out the false accusation and the false foundation, as um, Michael just called it, of the Roman Catholic Church, which claims that St. Peter, the apostle Peter, who was a follower of Jesus Christ, ever was in Rome and is even the first pope or the first bishop for that matter. Because the bishop... And the Pope matter is something, therefore you have to study Romanism and the Reformation, and you will understand that in the first six centuries there never was any Pope. They were only bishops, the bishops of Rome. Yeah, but anyway, shall I start? Please do, very so profound then, yeah. comments. <laughs> then here. we can then and we can try to uh, <clears throat> continue this It's absolutely reading. just wonderful, the momentum that you've built up in studying, and uh, I just want to be... Uh, an advocate to keep that going. That's the main purpose of me coming on here and, and being a part of these is to just in any way possible help. And because you just take the words right out of my mouth too. So well, that's, that's wonderful. just wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Mm. Okay, we start on page 19 then. Uh, as you can see the little yellow letters to this day, this is where we took off last time. And um, I will just put another picture in here of uh, Peter's tomb, because that's what we are speaking about. And the author says here, To this day, the Roman Catholic Church says that the tomb of St. Peter is under the altar of the Basilica in Rome. Quote, Only the actual vault itself, in which the body lies, is no longer accessible and has not been so since the 9th century. So that's already... 1100 years from now. There are those, however, the article continues, who think that it would not be impossible to find the entrance and to reopen it once more. A unanimous request that this should be done was made to Antichrist Pope Leo XIII by the International Archaeological Congress in 1900, but so far means even up to today, 2018, without result. And therefore, you can go to newadvent.org. Let me just check if I have that site still open. No, it's another site that I opened. So I went to newadvent.org because the link doesn't work here. And I mm. searched the article and I uh, put the link in the, uh, in the new uh, PDF that I have here. And this will of, will, of course, also be when I publish this PDF. And you can go to that article of newadvent.org. Uh, and then read this article on Arthur S. Barnes, where exactly the words that I just cited are written in the way that they are the, 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 that I cited them here. Now, what supposedly happened, and this is very important, that you always understand these little tiny words in these things that we are reading. It supposedly happened. Yeah? It is, oh, maybe it could have been, or maybe it's just another Roman fable. 
<laughs> what supposedly <laughs> happened at the death of the Apostle Peter in Rome was that Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. According to Catholic tradition, Peter asked that to be crucified upside down, stating that he was not worthy to suffer the same kind of death as his master Jesus Christ. Then he was buried under the altar, which now is the Basilica of St. Peter. Now, here is a Catholic account. Yeah? <laughs> Always consider the sources. Here is a Catholic account of what happened to Peter's body on the night of his death. In Keller's comments below, which we will read in a moment, he shows that he believes that Simon Peter was buried below the Vatican Cemetery. He mistakes Simon Magus for Simon Peter and tells what happened at the death of Simon in Rome during the first century. Now we'll read a quote from Keller's comment uh, that is to be found the, as the official comment of the Roman Catholic Church on page 368. Quote, on the night of his death, on the cross, Peter's followers buried his body. As in the case of Jesus on the hill of Calvary, it was wrapped in linen and secretly taken to a pagan burial ground on the Via Cornelia. Via is a word for street, yeah, on the Cornelia street, behind the stone structure of the arena. At the arena, that is what you call today the Circus Maximus, by the way. And the, that was the old arena where they persecuted Christians. This pagan cemetery lay on a knoll called Vaticanus. And the Americans know all about a knoll, right? Since JFK? Mm. Mm -hmm. Grassy knoll, or what's it called yep. there? Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. The Latin word vatus means divine, a prophet or soothsayer. In days gone by there had been an Etruscan oracle on this spot. Unquote. Now, Keller ought to have better logic to know that this Peter, buried in this cemetery, of all places, could not be the Apostle Peter. In the first place, Peter was a Jew, and they had to be buried in their own cemeteries that is only reserved for Jews. This is quite a big step from not even being able to eat with Gentiles than to be buried in the special cemeteries reserved for the chief pagans and self-proclaimed gods or Peters. And even if by a happen chance a Jew could be buried in a Roman cemetery, it is most unlikely that a Jew, especially one who attacked the Roman religion as the Apostle Peter did, would ever have been allowed into the most holy of pagan cemeteries. This cemetery was reserved for prophets, soothsayers, and the great ones of pagan Rome. The records regarding Simon's death vary widely. Yeah, you know, to one fable comes another. Let me just have a sip of my coffee here. Hmm. Yeah, need to do that, otherwise it's getting cold. I don't like cold coffee. <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't either. <laughs> now, many of the stories try to incorporate some fiction from the Greek and Egyptian myths to, the enhan to enhance the reader's interest in, fascinating, uh, in this fascinating character. But the earliest records say that he was buried in Rome after a long period of great honors and deification. It is not clearly known where Simon Magus alias Simon Peter died. At the judgment, I'm almost sure many will be quite surprised to find out who really is under the altar in the Basilica in Rome. And it will not be the beloved Simon Peter, the Apostle of Jesus Christ. The great faith that is placed on what appears to many to be the Apostle Peter's bones under the altar of the Basilica is somewhat comical, especially in light of the lack of any biblical evidence that show that Peter was never in Rome. Whose bones could be under that altar? Now, I believe that they are the bones of Simon Magus, Peter, a.k.a. the first pope, or let's better say the first bishop of Rome. Yet, this most likely will not, nor could be proven till the return of Christ himself. The certainty of this is the discovery of Peter's tomb in Jerusalem. Now, 
what have we just read in this last little paragraph here? It's a lot of guesswork, right? We have to guess if Peter is there or not there. Now, the Bible does not let us guess. The Bible gives us certainty. The Bible states in no place, nowhere in the whole Bible, in any place, to put it in these words, that the Apostle Peter ever was even near to Rome. The Apostle Peter was an Apostle to the circumcised, not to the uncircumcised. Paul yeah. was the Apostle to the uncircumcised. That is not guesswork. But everything that the author says here, and that many other people also say, is just guessing work. They don't know. And even if this tomb they claim is under the altar in the Basilica of Rome will be reopened and the bones taken out of there um, they didn't have DNA analysis at the time did they how do we know that these bones then ever belong to Peter that's one question but the second question to end all of the silly guesswork right now I tell you with the authority of the Bible it does not matter because the Bible clearly states the living know that they have to die and the dead know nothing it is unimportant where Peter died Jesus Christ himself gave him the clue that he probably would die of a persecuted ma uh, in a persecuted manner yeah he told him that someday he will be dressed without dressing himself and will be led where he doesn't want to be. That's what Jesus Christ told him. Why can't we just be satisfied with the words of our Lord himself? Why do we always have to put guesswork in it and say, oh, it was maybe this or oh, it was maybe that. And then we follow tradition after tradition and rumor after rumor. You know, this is just silly. Mm, it sure this, is. I, I found a really interesting psalm here mm -hmm. to to add to this. Uh, Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols, worship him, all ye gods. And this is Psalms 97, verse 7. thought that was interesting. Yeah, good find. Good <clears throat> yeah, find. because, you know, the boasting that this church that stands on this false system of worship it's it's standing right on this Simon Magus I mean and they call him Peter and people really think it's true and this is what this whole series is about it's a superstitious church yeah yes and it, it is. is a church that is built upon upon relics and relic worship and graven images. And graven images. And this is exactly what God forbid in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 4 through 7. Yes. So if I go back a verse, it, it says, The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all they that serve graven, graven images. Confused mm -hmm. be all they that serve graven images. It's Babylon. That boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Worship the Lord of creation. Worship the true savior of the world. Turn from idols. Turn from false systems of worship and false doctrines. And this world is just full of them. And I'm sure I even have some of it left in what I do every day. I and guess I don't we all have, know. Brett. I guess we all yes. have. Yes. We do. It's incredible. But don't give up. Don't ever give up. Well, you know, the Bible says us very clearly, there's not one righteous, no, not one. Even we are not. We do our best. Yes. But we, we are still wrecked, uh, wretched sinners. Yes, we are. Wicked. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Also, this is just another claim from the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, mm -hmm. they no, have no that, proof. That's yeah, true. That, yeah, because uh, some churches of the Roman Catholic uh, organization, as I uh, may call them so, they just, uh, yeah, 
they just uh, tell you that they got the foreskin of Jesus and uh, such crap. So you see that uh, jo so much uh, so much claims out there. That mm -hmm. obviously, obviously, uh, if there are if there are so many churches uh, which uh, are claiming they got this uh, the the same item, uh, so it, it cannot be. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's and so that's it's, that's an interesting point that you make. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you there, Michael. Yeah. You were speaking about mm -hmm. the foreskin of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. When you read the book Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow that he published in 1966 mm -hmm. and retracted much later because uh, he sold a soul, but that's another thing. When you read that book, you will find out that at least three churches all over the world claim to have a piece of the foreskin of Jesus Christ. That's one. The other one that I wanted to tell you is that in the book it is written, in Babylon Mystery Religion, and I think it is uh, in the same way more or less written in the book uh, The Two Babylons from Alexander Hislop, that when you put all the pieces of wood together that you can gather where the church claims that this is a, a piece of the real wood of the real cross where Jesus Christ was crucified, you can build another arch. Another ark, mm. ark of Noah. You could build another yeah. ark from all the pieces of wood around the world which yeah. claim to be oh, a piece oh. of the real cross where Jesus Christ our Lord was crucified on. This Man. is how ridiculous this r relic chasing and relic collection, collecting is, mm. actually. And but this is why God condemns us in the Bible as foolishness. Yeah. Mm. But but it's not of no use to build another ark because there will be no 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 second flood. <laughs> no, that's right. right, but it's just to make a mental picture that you can imagine yeah, no, how much just, wood just, would be needed. Yeah. Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah. I know, I know. That's right. <laughs> anyway, um, let's continue in the reading here. But I, I think this is an, an interesting point that we have to make at one moment at this reading. That this is all silliness about claiming where the tomb of Peter is. I mean, like the picture that you see here, Peter's tomb recently discovered in Jerusalem. And we are going to back, uh, going to that even a little bit farther in the, in the, in the text when we're going to read on. This is just silliness. This is just ridiculous. So let me continue. And let me, again, point to the thing that is important. Important is that we understand that Jesus is the Christ that he is the only begotten Son of God who came down to this earth and shed his blood for our sins. He died and rose after three days and went up to heaven and now sits at the right hand of God until he comes back, until the Father makes, the, uh, makes his enemies his footstool. That is important to understand. And that you have that Jesus Christ. And no man on earth can ever take the place of the God-man, the Son of Man, who walked among men according to the Bible it says in John the word became flesh in the beginning of John it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then a little bit later on in another chapter it says and the flesh and and the word became flesh and walked among us how much more proof do you need that Jesus Christ was God, is God, will always be God and is the one who takes your sin away. Nobody else. And therefore this is a childish discussion, discussion even about this Saint Peter in Rome. Mm -hmm. And I do not follow childish discussions and ne neither does Michael and neither does Brett because our time is too valuable to do that. But but you have to understand that this childish discussion leads many people to the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church. And because they believe these fables, they go into the Roman Catholic religion and think that they are saved, but they are actually not saved. They are walking on the road to perdition. And that's why we are doing these broadcasts, that those people can come out of it. We are not preaching to the choir who already knows everything. We want other people who are betrayed to get to know the truth. And with this reading, put them into the interest to do their own studies and come to their own conclusions. And then follow the word of God in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 
where God says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you do not receive of her plagues, because God hath remembers her iniquities. Now let me continue reading this childish article. A well-hidden discovery of an archaeologist is the burial place of St. Peter at Jerusalem. This is documented in a book called Gli Scavi del Dominus Flevit, printed in 1958 at the Typographia del P.P. Francescani in Jerusalem. P.B. Bagatti and J.T. Millick, both Roman Catholic priests, <laughs> consider the source, wrote it. Here's a little bit of the proof that they used to document that the tomb of St. Peter is in fact in Jerusalem. On the Franciscan monastery site called Dominus Flevit, where Jesus was supposed to have wept over Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, the excavation where the names of Christian biblical characters were found on the ossuaries, which are bone boxes. The names of Mary and Martha were found on one box, and right next to it was one with the name of Lazarus, their brother. Isn't that convenient, I ask you? <laughs> How convenient to have all that in the same place, right? <laughs> the names of Mary and Martha were found on one box and right next to it was the name of Lazarus. Other names of early Christians were found on other boxes. Of greatest interest, however, for the Roman Catholics, of course, <laughs> or maybe not, was that which was found within 12 feet from the place where the remains of St. Mary, Martha and Lazarus were found. The remains of St. Peter. Oh, 12 feet. Interesting distance, eh? 12 apostles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were found in an ossuary, on the outside of which was clearly and beautifully written in Aramaic, Simon Bar Jonah. Now, this could refer to any other than St. Peter. But what makes the possibility of error more remote is that the remains were found in a Christian burial ground and more yet of the first century, the very time in which Peter lived. In fact, noted scientist, a, a noted scientist stating that he can tell by the writing that it was written just before the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in 70 AD. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> probably a very trustworthy person. And we quote, There is a hundred times more evidence that Peter was buried in Jerusalem than in Rome. Unquote. Now, a little side note that I had found quite strange. When an internet search is done on the tomb of Peter using the keywords Dominus Flevit, you may, f may, may find a website or two, but when you do it, does not last long, so I suggest that you print it out fast. Now, you know me, uh, I have to do my own research, so here is the site that I found when I used the um, search words Tomb of Peter, Dominus Flevit. I came down to this website, aloha.net, Mikesh Peter's Jerusalem tomb, blah, blah, blah. And here you see, um, here you see the charcoal writings in the, um, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the bone box, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, inscription and a lot of text. And here you see pictures. Oh, wait, uh, maybe I can give you guys a little picture of this. Uh, just share my screen and um, you can see this. Can you see this? Yes. So this is the article here on the top. Uh, this is where we come from. This is here on this uh, obituary or what it's called, the stone, the bone box and uh, the inscription in Hebrew from Strong's Concordance, Jonah bar Simon, but you have to read in Hebrews, of course, from right to left, uh, from left, uh, from right to left. So it reads hmm. Simon bar Jonah. And then all this article, if you want, if you have the time to go through it, here are pictures of the sepulchre on Mount of Olives, where the bones of St. Peter and other early Christians were found. How convenient that they found them there. On this bone box, the name is written Simon Bar Jonah, that you see here in the picture. Uh, on the middle stone found in this exca uh, excavation, one sees a mark, which is the first of two letters of the Greek word, which means Christ. And here you have, from left to right, Mr. S.J. Matar. Oh, uh, does that stand for Society of Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Author? more than likely. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. The author and, uh, and priest J.T. Millick, 
The priest confirming the inscription of Simon Barjona in this book mentioned therein, of which he is a co-writer. And then we scroll down to the article and scroll and scroll and scroll. And here you see the book mentioned in the article, Glis Gavi del Dominus Flevit, part one. And uh, some links here that you can do even more research on that stuff for yourself. Of course, this website that I just found, I will add to... Um, to the document so you can find that there I'm gonna share uh, stop the sharing of the screen and we can go on uh, reading in the article here we have a picture of uh, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus again now um, this is here the uh, the link to the web th website that I just showed you so you can use this for your own investigation and uh, we're going to read where the author continues. After all this discovery of the tomb of Peter in Jerusalem is quite embarrassing to the Church of Rome. So, sorry, I have to pronounce this correctly. After all, this discovery of the tomb of Peter in Jerusalem is quite embarrassing to the Church of Rome, since it strikes at the very pillar of its faith and the idea of apostolic succession, exactly the point that Michael was making earlier. Yeah? Biblically, it has been shown that Peter was not in Rome and now archaeology, ar ar archaeologically, we see that the Apostle Peter's tomb has been found in Jerusalem. This strikes at the very tradition, at the very heart of St. Peter's bones being under the altar of at St. Peter's Basilica. Is there a comment I can expect from one of you two guys? No. no, I did. I did make it before. Hmm. <laughs> okay, that's what I mentioned. Yeah. yeah, I just thought I heard something and maybe wanted to give you guys the chance to uh, express well, thank, yourself here. Thanks, but no thanks. Sure, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks, brother. I just, uh, <clears throat> I think I, uh, I just made a little noise there. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Sometimes I just take this noise that maybe somebody wants to say something. That's why I'm asking. No problem. So we continue. As a side note, on December 23rd, 1950, in this pre-Christmas broadcast on radio, Antichrist Hitler's Pope Pius XII announced the discovery of St. Peter's tomb far below the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Oh, maybe this is like the House of Rosetta, uh, the House of, uh, what's it called? Mm. Uh, I, I don't remember. You know, this house that was yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was transported by angels. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I remember, but I, I, I cannot tell the name. Yeah, uh, I, I have yeah. the same problem. It's, it, yeah. it's the stone of Rosetta. That's something else. But it's, it's the house of, oh, I don't know. Read Babylon Mystery Religion. It's in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you can read about angels of transporting the birth house of, uh, of Mary, I think it is, to the Vatican, oh. you know. Oh. Uh, maybe that's how they brought St. Peter's tomb from Jerusalem uh, to uh, below the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Hmm. This was again in 1968. Antichrist Pope Paul VI announced that those bones belong to Peter. He's a trustworthy man, you know. When he says it, that's the truth, right? <laughs> that's if one right. Were <laughs> If one supposedly. were suspicious, <laughs> yeah, supposedly. If yeah. one were suspicious, they would have to question why suddenly in the 20th century did the popes have to claim that St. Peter's bones were under the altar of the basilica? Why didn't they do that earlier? We saw early already that Simon Magus went to Rome to start a quote-unquote universal, which we all know can be understood also as Catholic Church. We also see that Simon Magus was a self-proclaimed god, where the title of Peter was given. We read that even from in the Bible, that people took him for god, right? That's in Acts chapter 8. There are also several traditions that do not fit with the Bible, but are common today with the papacy. Now, isn't that a sentence to think a little bit about? <laughs> the Roman Catholic traditions that do not fit the Bible but are very common with the papacy? The mm. papacy always teaches a 180 degree opposite of what is taught in the Bible. Any and everything the papacy claims is never to be found in the Bible. So of course there are several traditions 
Brett, you are very yes. good with the Bible from stating from your heart. What did Jesus Christ tell to the scribes and the Pharisees concerning their traditions? Oh, my. Uh, he said quite a great deal, and I just can't think of it at the moment. But I'll tell you, what I do think of is the wonderful readings that Tom Fress has done for all these years, and that us Gentiles are guilty of mixing the holy with the profane as well as the Jews. Mm -hmm. We're both guilty of it. Yeah. We are not to do this. And this is what this is. Yeah, I'm the not... traditions and the scribes, the Pharisees. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really going to be harsh judgment against them. I'm not also... using godly words. I'm not using biblical words. Mm -hmm. But when you want to hear the essence of what Jesus Christ said to the scribes and the Pharisees, what to do with their traditions, he said, shove it. Yeah, that's right. Shove it. Now, what is the link that I hope to show with Simon Magus and the title of Peter? That Simon Magus was called Simon Peter, Simon the self-proclaimed God, after he moved to Rome and set up a false universal religion with himself as the head of the church. The author says that he believes, and I believe that too, that it would be safe to say that Simon Magus is the Simon Peter of Rome, that is called the first pope, or better said the first bishop, of the Roman Catholic Church, and not the apostle Simon Peter of the Bible. I agree with the author fully. And I think my two brothers on the phone do the same. Mm -hmm. I believe that the above quotes say it all, everything that we have read during the first four in this broadcast. They say that the Simon Magus, quote-unquote Peter, who proclaimed to be a false messiah, God, with the cover of Christianity, to set up a universal meaning Catholic Church. This is the Catholic first pope. This is the Catholic first bishop in Rome and the beginning of the Church of Babylon that has affected history. Now the Apostle Paul saw it also, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I made two broadcasts with Tom Fress and you can watch these on my YouTube channel if you look them up. Just type in the search engine on my channel Second Thessalonians 2 and then you will find these videos. And Brett, I think just yesterday um, uploaded one part uh, uh, no, not yesterday, but uh, uploaded well, it was one a couple weeks two, right? back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a week or two ago, yeah. Yes. So you can also find that on Brett's channel. And um, that video is, I think, called uh, The Importance of Understanding Second Thessalonians Chapter 2 Correctly in Light of the Antichrist. Some, that's some mm -hmm. of the title in there. So this just underlines what the author says here, that Paul also saw this in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and that that and mystery of iniquity that is meant here was... Simon Magus operating out of Rome. Now here's a list of a few writings that we may want to keep in mind as we read the New Testament. These show that there is a false church in the shadows of the true church. The beginning of the false church was already starting. The falling away was in direct competition and in conflict with the apostles and the true teachings of Christ. Well, for example, you read Second, Cor uh, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse four. It says, quote, "For if some one if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus who we preached." Unquote. In Galatians chapter one, verse seven, we read, "Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ." Unquote. By fifty three A.D., this was written. This uh, epistle. And that is just another teaching at work. The whole book of Colossians, 
was probably devoted to counteract the teaching of the Church of Simon Magus. That, by the way, uh, is very important to stand still for a moment at Colossians. And I will open my King James Bible online that you can read along with me when I open the book of Colossians here. Chapter 1. Very important when we go to verse 14. And this just um, makes absolutely sense in the uh, when we read it in regard to what we've read here. The author says here, the whole book of Colossians was probably devoted to counterattack the teaching of the church of Simon Magus. Now, what does the King James state on Colossians chapter 1, verse 14? Quote, In whom, speaking of Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, you go to your bookshelf or to your computer and look up any of this new forgerized Bibles like the NIV, the ESV, and so on, and so on, and you will look until eternity, and you will never find the three words through his blood in this verse, because they scrapped it, they took it out, they deleted it. And all the modern Bible versions you can only read, and whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, not through his blood. Now, how does that fit with what the author says here? The whole book of Colossians was probably devoted to counteract the teaching of the church of Simon Magus. So when that is true, what the author says here, wouldn't it be logical for them to corrupt the Bible in the book of Colossians and take out the healing uh, act of the blood of Jesus Christ through his blood out of this? Doesn't that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And what they're actually doing is just obfuscating it. They're hiding it. Yeah. It's there. And I think this is just my gut speaking, okay? I think the people of God know it, but they just haven't discovered it yet. That's all. They need help, Brett. Yes, they do. That's why Isn't we are here. And that's why we are doing these readings. Yep, that's right. Isn't there a phrase? which uh, states that you're not only responsible for the things you are saying, but you're also mm. responsible for the things you're not saying. Yeah, That's that right. is a, a quote from Martin Luther. That is a, 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 at least a set uh, mm -hmm. attributed to Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. You're not That's only re very responsible point, for what you Michael. say, but also for what you do not say. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, one of the past uh, brothers in Christ we had at one time was uh, telling, I believe, is telling you, Yerk, that uh, along those same lines, that it's it's not what they say, it's what they're not telling you. That's the whole secret of secret societies, Brett. It is, isn't it? That is the secret of compartmentalization. Yes, it is. That is the difference between being an initiate and being a novice. Or being mm -hmm. a layman. Mm hmm. Yeah. Very That's it. much so. The yeah. difference between the things they say and the things they do not say, or the things they only say to certain people. Mm hmm. Right. Exactly. Good point, Michael, to bring this uh, quote up here. Welcome. Now, again. The whole book of Colossians was probably devoted to counteract the teaching of the Church of Simon Magus. Therefore, of course, the Church of Simon Magus has a very special interest in corrupting the book of Colossians and the teaching of Colossians. And therefore, you have to be very, very careful because I tell you, when you go into the next chapter, 2 Colossians verse 16 and 17, you have to be very careful how you read these verses even in the King James because of words in italics. And I do not go into there because that is a whole other broadcast of itself. But when you want to read the essence of these two verses and you want to read it the way that it was originally written, then you read... 
Let no man therefore judge you but the body of Christ. And this is very, very important. And these two verses have made much bloodshed between Christians, have caused many discussions and problems within the body of Christ because of different understandings, because even in the King James, sorry to say, even in the King James, by using the italic words, this sentence gets a complete different understanding than what I just read to you. But what I just read to you of Second Colossians chapter six, uh, verse 16 and 17, that is the essence, that is the main sentence. Let no man therefore judge you but the body of Christ. Let no man judge you but the body of Christ. Now what does the Pope say? He cannot be judged by any man, not even by the body of Christ, but he is judging every man. And therefore you can go back to 1302 and the bull Unam Sanctum of Antichrist Innocent VIII. Sorry about this little excursion I needed into the mm. Bible here. This is, to me, a very important point, especially since the author here brings up sure. the book of Colossians. And yeah. I hope that you, my two brothers here on the call, and everybody out there who listens to this understands how important this little sentence is. The whole book of Colossians was probably devoted to counteract the teaching of the Church of Simon Magus. Therefore, it is important for the Church of Simon Magus, which is the Roman Catholic Church, to counterfeit the book of Colossians and to sow doubt and misunderstanding in the writing of the Word of God. And that's why I just told you about this. But let's continue. When you read the book of Colossians, there seems to be many basic doctrines addressed that should already be a common knowledge from their Jewish neighbors. Now, Paul uses many Jewish examples and references, uh, and references specifics such as feasts and holidays. Now, we can tell that they have been exposed to a biblical culture previously, but they seem to have lost some basic doctrines of God's plan of salvation and Christ. Uh, like the blood in one fourteen, right? Now this yeah, is because, absolutely. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's you got it. You're you're just sailing right along. <laughs> <laughs> now this is because of the teaching of Simon Magus in direct conflict with the gospel that was being taught by the apostles. The book of Jude was to warn that the idea of the false church was affecting the true church and they were even among the church itself pretending to be the body of Christ's church. That reminds me, before I even go on reading, I see the author mentions here Daniel, but that remembers me of Daniel, you know, the little horn that comes out of the ten horns, yeah? That's one kingdom that comes out of the other ten kingdoms, and of course that the falling away has to do with the original church, that it was the original church falling away out of which the wrong church, the Roman Catholic Church, arose. And we read in the previous pages how that could only have been the Roman Catholic Church and how that came out of the true body of Christ. And this is what Paul warns over and over and over again in almost every, if not in every one of his epistles, in every letter that he wrote to the Colossians, to the Corinthians, to the Thessalonians, to the Hebrews, to uh, Timothy, to Titus, uh, name them all, where he always warns of a falling away out of their midst. And that is actually also um, where Jesus Christ keeps himself busy with in the first three chapters in the book of Revelation, which is the, the revelation of Jesus Christ for us, for his true body that remains here on earth for as long as it is necessary, means until he comes back. Now in the book of Daniel, the author says, where it speaks of the Roman Catholic Church, it is shown that worship 
and the false church is going to be cloaked within the true church of God. The book of Daniel also points to where the fourth beast, the Catholic Church, is to arise. The book of Acts says a lot by what it does not record in the travels of the twelve apostles. It seems that ten of the apostles are rarely ever mentioned, and that great detail is given to the apostles Paul and Peter. Now the travels of the apostles Paul and Peter is given most detail about when they went to spread where they went to spread the gospel. If the apostles' travel were traced on a map, it would point to Rome and the surrendering era. Why were the ten the other ten apostles' travels not followed very close at all? Now the reason is very simple. The physician and apostle Luke knew and understood from the book of Daniel where this false church would come from. The Roman Empire. From the book of Daniel in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8 and chapter 11, Luke understood that the false church was to rise out of Rome. Realizing that the false church was to rise out of Rome, Luke gave special attention to the travels of Paul and Peter to show where they were and to document where they spread the gospel. With this close attention to details of Paul's travels, we have a warning from prophecy regarding where the false church was to come from and when and how the false church started and how it came into direct conflict with the true church. This is why the Apostle Luke did not track the other apostles' travels directly. When you read through the epistles, it seems to cover some basic doctrines. I believe this is due to the false church that was already at work, as stated by the Apostle Paul. The main point that I hope to bring to your attention is evidence that all points to the rise of the false church and that Simon Magus was the head of that church. These are just a few examples that should be kept in mind when you read through the New Testament and if you run across something that almost seems out of place or just too basic. It is most likely due to Simon Magus or his teaching at the time of the Apostles. With this new understanding of the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church already in place and having an effect on the true teaching of the Gospels, you will have some insight to the true meanings of an open verse discussion. It is with this evidence that I hope to show that the idea of apostolic succession is based upon the wrong Simon Peter. The Simon Magus Peter that is in fact an impostor and self-serving pagan high priest is the true beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. One of the main pillars of the Roman Catholic Church is the idea that apostolic succession is the foundation of the Catholic Church. This is false and this is based upon the wrong Peter. This is their claim to power and they claim it makes them the true church. The only thing wrong with this idea is they have the wrong Simon Peter and it is leading many astray from the true word of God. And then I give you the link to the source where I got this paper initially from. And this closes our introduction from Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. And we will continue, of course, because we have the whole book of Ernest Martin ahead of us. That is another 34 pages in a wonderful book. I just wanted to use this dissertation as an introduction to the reading coming up, where I hope that also my brother Brett and brother Michael, who are with me on the call today, will accompany me in the reading of that book. So, that this is just an introduction to that, that you will get the most full understanding and that you do not only hear from one side. That you do not only hear from the author Ernest Martin, but that you also hear from this person who wrote this on the website of Presence of God Ministry, which is a 
Seventh Day Remnant website. Yeah, I know that, and I have no affiliation with Seventh Day Adventists, but there are some things, and especially when you are going to do historical research in a biblical way, there are some information. There is some information that you can only find on sites like these. Therefore, That's I do not very, agree with their doctrine. I am very much in favor of the saying, "Eat the meat and spit out the bones." Use your go. own discernment and understand, and take the good and throw away the bad. That's what you have to do. And to understand what is the good and what is the bad, your foundation must be, not should be, must always be the correct word of God. In this case, the 1611 King James Bible. And um, I want to leave a few last words for Brother Brett, who is very anxious to contribute today <laughs> to the broadcast. I have never seen you this awake in the morning, brother. It's wonderful. But please give us your insight here. Well, you just made a wonderful reading and discussion at the end of this article. And I just can't help. The spirit is just yearning to say that uh, this false system of worship is so intertwined with the false doctrines that have been taught in all institutions on the face of the earth. They have to use the truth. They have to use this Kabbalah. They have to use this witchcraft. They have to use this sorcery. They have to use these lies through the father of lies to deceive all people on the face of the earth. And if possible, even the very elect of God that sit in the church and promote the words of Christ through the falsehood and the, the diabolical teachings they use and through this false system of worship. And when Christ comes back, he's not going to be very pleased about it. And he's going to destroy it all. And we have to separate ourselves from this. And my plea and my hope and my prayer is that the people that are involved in these false systems of worship would just come out of there and see the hypocrisy in both the church and the state and the institutions and all the false teaching. But it's a hard, difficult, and very disturbing road. And, and very long. few. And long. Very few find it yes very long and difficult winding road and it gets steep and ugly very quickly when once you get into this doctrine and and all of the poison that's been put upon the words and misused and changed and and uh, yeah Yerk, it's just incredible how uh, how deceived we've been for so long. But we don't need to be anymore. We don't need to be deceived anymore. And I thank you so much, Yerk, for doing this. And we got the introduction done. Now we can head to the next reading. Yeah, to Ernest Martin's book. Yes, that's right. And this is uh, special thanks to uh, our uh, our uh, brother who wrote this, and uh, Nicholas at Presence of God Ministry. No, and, it's not uh, Nicholas. It's uh, from one of the contributors to his website. Oh, it's from a contributor. Yeah, ah, yeah. cool. But when Sounds. you go, when you when you follow the link that I put there, you come to. Uh, to the site where there is much information uh, of Nicholas himself, of course, and, and this is just one part of the of that very long page, and uh, he has much much more information on uh, this Simon Peter versus Simon Magus thing than just this contribution of uh, one of his uh, followers there. But I found that very interesting to take that out and use that as an introduction to the reading of the book of Ernest Martin. Yeah, isn't it something, though, if you think of the, the Jesuit strategy, creating a de denominational church, even the Seventh-day Adventists, and 
foisting these different doctrines on the people. And, you know, if you really believe in this doctrine that the Seventh-day Adventists put forward as the truth and the light, then you will attack us like there's no tomorrow. Because we don't stand by denomination. We stand by Christ alone, in the Bible alone, through his word alone, for his glory alone, and in grace alone. That's it. That's our faith. I couldn't have said it any better, Brett. It's incredible when you think of it, though, how these deceivers have woven this web of deception through all of this tradition. And we all need to come out of this tradition. Because it's going to destroy us. Even my own mother and my family. It's going to destroy them. I would to God they would just come out kicking and screaming about this. But I can't do nothing than just keep going. It's all we can do. Brothers and sisters, that's all we can do. We got to keep going. We got to endure all of it till the end. We got to live through it. Thank you, Brad. As best we can. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Yerk. I will leave a closing remark to Brother Michael, who probably sits there as anxious to contribute something. One closing remark? Are you serious? <laughs> One? Not even two. At least three. Well, go along. Uh, thanks in advance. <laughs> thanks to my brother, Brad. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I, 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 um, I was so uh, anxious to, and I have written down some closing comments, because actually in this... Uh, Simon Magus versus Simon Peter introduction, there was uh, a very important word mentioned, which was uh, a counteract. The Roman Catholic Church is a counteract, and so it's quite easy um, to put, uh, to put uh, away the disguise, because uh, you see that Satan is the father of lies. And uh, so, if the Roman Catholic Church lies to you, then it can need not be the Church of the Almighty God. You see it, for example, um, uh, for, the, for the name of the Pope, Innocence. It's quite the opposite. She, he, he should have been called Pope Guilty. Or Society of Jesus. It's quite the opposite. There is no Jesus because Jesus demanded that they shall not kill. Or, for example, the congregation of faith is just the congregation of the unfaithful. So, I, in my point of view, they're occupying us with false claims, lies, distracting us. In, and, and following human, sinful traditions instead of reading your Bible. I think that's the ultimate goal to keep us distracting from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. It's mm -hmm. quite the opposite to, to which what the Bible tells us to do. And so if you, if you find one false claim after, after another, you can be sure that it's no coincidence or laziness, or whatever you might think. It's just a pure, devilish concept. It's just sat Satanism. That's mm -hmm. all it is, because it's it's the contrary, it's the opposite of what the Bible tells us. And so, as Jesus claimed that uh, the, the devil is the father of, of lies, and the Roman Catholic Church is lying to you, that what do you think the Roman Catholic Church belongs to? It's it's so easy. It's it's actually very easy. We can we can name every false claim, every lie they are spreading out. But in the end, it all comes to this: that the Roman Catholic Church is the liar, because it's a church of the father of lies. It's simple as that. It, it cannot it cannot be otherwise. 
because because their tradition is an opposite of the holy word of word of the Bible. And what's the opposite of the holy word? What's the opposite of holy? It's unholy. It's sinful. It's evil. That's my closing remark. Thank you very much, Michael. And I just want to pick it up in the sense that you were speaking of with a little reading of the Bible, Matthew chapter 4. We are mm -hmm. speaking about the temptation of Jesus Christ. You were, you were making the point that we only have the Bible. That's the same point that Brett made. We have to understand that we have to go to the Bible and the Bible alone. The Bible is the one thing that Satan cannot control, that Satan hates, and that he wants to get out of it. And there is one, in my mind at least, prime example of how the devil, there is only one way to defeat the devil, and that is when you read Matthew chapter 4. Now I'm not going to read the whole chapter, maybe that's for another time. But we know that when Jesus Christ was baptized in the river Jordan, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit and to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for forty days and forty nights. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, uh, doesn't that remind you of what the serpent said to Eve in the Garden of Eden? Yea. Did God really say? If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. Now the devil taketh them up, up to the holy city, set them on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, yea, has God really said? Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest that any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Three times Jesus Christ defeats the devil, by purely mentioning and citing from the Bible the Word of God. And that's the only way we can defeat Satan, and that's the only way that we can find the lies in this world and the lies spread by the Roman Catholic Church by measuring everything that we hear and see and learn in this world, measuring it up to the Bible. And when we can confirm anything in this world with it is written, then it is correct. And if it is not correct, then we have exposed the darkness. And that's what this reading is all about. Exposing the darkness of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. Until next time, when we will start the reading of the book by Ernest Martin, Simon Peter meets the competition. Maranatha. The fool hath said, in his heart there is no God, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that do is good. The fool hath said in his heart, This is how the foolish justify